It is Tuesday, April 9th. This is the Christian Commute. That's right. This is still a show. This is still a podcast. I'm your host, Seth Dunn, and you're riding home with me in the rain in the mid-afternoon. I'm in the Kia Soul. I hope the sound quality is better. I know you guys have, uh, I think two or three people have written in saying the sound quality has been bad. I noticed on a couple of shows. And I don't know if it's because my microphone's getting old, there's too much noise in whatever car I'm driving, which is sometimes the, the old F-150, or you know what I think it is? I haven't been using Audacity lately, the thing on the computer where I pull in the WAV file or the MP3 file and process it, because I use Audacity to put in the intro and the outro, and just for whatever reason... It has not been convenient for me to put the files on the computer. So I've just been uploading MP3 straight through my phone. So I wonder if Audacity was doing something to knock out the background noise. I'm not sure. And now the files are lower quality because they're from the phone. But who knows? Another, just another technical difficulty in my life. Let me let you in on something. Here's where I am on the assets that I have. And my laptop's on its last legs, by the way. When I turned my car on before I started this show, I said, please, Jesus. Like, that's where I am when I'm trying to turn my car on. I got to say, please, Jesus, first. Listen, if I drive, God's sovereign all the time, but if I had a brand new car, I'm not saying, please, Jesus, when I turn it. But the Kia Soul is its own thing, okay? It's its own situation. And we're about to find out if I can make it to Cartersville on less than a quarter tank of gas in a Kia Soul. I bet I don't. I bet I, I hope I remember to stop. The battery has been iffy on this thing. And I don't know if it's the battery is old or if it's because I've left the lights on twice. Like, this is, I don't know how it's happening. Like, my tail lights will be on, but the headlights won't be. And I think the headlights work. I better turn them on now because it's raining outside. I think it's the law to turn your headlights on when your uh, windshield wipers are on. So I, I assume they work. I can't see them. But there's something that's been running my battery down. And I think it's just the tail lights being on randomly. And by the way, the reason you haven't heard from me in the Kia Soul, there's two reasons. One is because I didn't do a show at all last week because it was spring break and my kids were out of school. So Monday and Wednesday, I don't go to work anyway. I work from home. Tuesday, my kids rode to work with me, and I just wanted to hang out with my kids on the way home instead of do a podcast. Well, two of them did. Thursday, another one of my children came to work with me. And Friday, I took a half a day off and just worked from home for that half day because I wanted to go to the ball fields with my sons. So I had an absolutely fantastic spring break. I didn't really take any big trips. We went to my in-law's house. I did the episode on Easter at your in-law's. I didn't fall asleep during church, but I almost did. If that tells you anything about my experience at church, I didn't stay up too late. Listen, I went to bed, I guess, around midnight and got up at 9 a.m. So I had nine hours of sleep. And then I got into the back of that pew. I was like, "Woo! can we liven up this sermon a little bit? Good on paper. But then I didn't even upload that show before Easter. So we took that trip, and then uh, came home with like it was as bonus. It was bonus week. I got my bonus. So like every year, I've just run out of money between January and February. It's after Christmas, and like insurance bills are hitting. I'm like, I don't have anything. And then bonus comes in. I'm like, oh, I finally actually have money. So I was like totally not stressed at all about life because I got money in the bank, and I wasted a little bit of it because why not? on spring break so I we went out and had some fun so I still have a little bit left but uh, one might think Seth if you're if you're having to say please Jesus when you turn your car on maybe use some of that bonus money to I don't know buy a battery so I think I might which goes to the second reason you haven't heard from the Kia Soul in a while is the battery was dead I parked it in my driveway the taillights got left on somehow I don't know and the battery was dead and when you have four cars And I have four cars, and as you guys know, I don't have, they're not particularly nice. Like, one is nice, and the other three 
are just there. I, I often compare them to having a full set of grandparents. Like, yeah, I've got, you know, when you got four grandparents, but they're all 95 years old, and they might not be with you long, much longer. So that's how it is for three of my cars. What, what, I got 170,000 miles on the Kia Soul, 160, four on the F-150. I got a, almost, I think I got a little over 100,000 on the, the white LX Honda Odyssey now, which needs a new timing belt. So this is getting to the story of like, oh, the battery's dead on one of my cars. That's okay. I have four. I'll drive one of these other two cars. <laughs> and then I was like, well, you know, I got some junk in the bed of the truck. I need to, uh, I'll drive the van. And I was like, oh, well, now the van needs a new timing belt. I, and I haven't got it yet because it's one of those things you're turning on your kitchen. Please, Jesus, let me get there. And so I'm like, I hadn't got that timing belt yet. So I'll go back to the Kia Soul. Well, the battery's dead. And the, and the right tire. Here's another thing. The right tire has a leak. So every five, five days, I have to blow it back up with an air compressor. So the Kia was dead, and I was just driving around in the other cars until I was like, you know what? Now I need to drive a different car. So let me go back to this other one. And uh, the Kia Soul, it, everything seems fine today. No lights are on. This morning, the traction control light was on. Apparently, this car had traction control. I didn't know that until the light came on saying it doesn't work. And it was raining. And I'm like, well, I need it in the rain. Why does it always go off in the rain? I don't need it when it's not raining. I'm not tearing through the world at 100 miles an hour in this Kia Soul. So those, those are the various reasons why I've been gone and there's been no show. It, it's, it seems like I'm in a world of hurt. I mean, the preacher put me to sleep. My cars barely work. But, it, you know, I've actually had a very nice week. I'm super happy. And my son's baseball, one of my son's baseball teams won last night. So, hey, but the Braves are winning. My kids are winning. I got three terrible cars. What, what can I complain about after a nice spring break? Let's get to the Christian commute. Boy, that was, a, that was a terribly long intro. I went for seven minutes talking about nothing. I'm so sorry. Let me not give you a show for a week. I've done one show in two weeks, and then I'm going to start my Let me talk about seven minutes about nothing. But here we go. Today's show title is Free Will of the Gaps. Free Will of the Gaps. I have a question in the inbox about the Holy Spirit and salvation. And as always, we have the Bible chapter review. We're in Luke chapter 1 still, verses 18 through 20. It's been so long I almost forgot where we left off. But I remembered this one because my son's name is Gabriel. He doesn't go by Gabriel because I really don't, I don't like that name. My wife liked that name, and I traded it to her. This is Listen, this is how you got to be, husbands. If you want to get what you want, you got to get, give your wife something she wants sometimes. I wanted to name my son Athanasius because Athanasius, the historical figure, was ten kinds of awesome. And my son, I knew, would be growing up in a horrible, pagan, transgender, ideology, critical race theory, Bible-hating world. You know, more so than it's been in a while. So I wanted him to remember to be strong in the faith like Athanasius was, which is a name like, who in the world names their son Athanasius? And my wife was like, we're not naming him that. And I'm like, what do you want to name him? Gabriel? I don't like that name. I, I never had, I know it's, I know it's an angel's name. I just don't like that name because I mean, I've never really liked anybody named Gabe that I've liked. I met anybody named Gabe that I've really liked. I just don't like the name Gabe. Gabe to me, the, if I, you say some guy, you're, t you're telling me about some kid, kid named Gabe. And I just think he's going to be chubby and not good at sports. That is just who I envision. When, you know, that's not anything objectively wrong with being chubby and not good sports. God made those people too. But I, I like to watch sports, and I want my kids to be lean, fast, and good at sports, okay? Would I love them anyway if they were chubby and not good at sports? Probably. Probably. But I just, Gabe, just, I, I, I never met anybody named Gabe that I've, that I've really liked. So I didn't like, I don't like the name Gabriel. I don't want to call him Gabe. And she's like, Gabriel. And I looked up what Gabriel means. And I'm like, well, it means strong man of God. And he's, he's, you know, he's pretty firm here. I like, I like how he acts in this verse. So I'll go with that. 
But I'll give you Gabriel if you give me Athanasius. And maybe I pretended to dislike Gabriel more, a little more than I really do. I don't know. And now it dawns on me that I went to school with a guy named Gabe. I don't have a problem with him if he's listening. I don't have a problem with you, Gabe. The Gabe who owns the bakery. No problem with you. Just in general, the Gabes. I, you know what? Gabe Hughes. Gabriel, I don't like Gabe Hughes. The guy from what? WWT. Um, when we understand the text. Which is an excellent resource. I just don't like him. And he doesn't like me. Uh, but anyway, don't like Gabe. But my son's name is Gabriel, and that is why I remembered, like, hey, we're getting to this verse where it's my son's name. Zacharias said to the angel. Now, the angel has just said to Zacharias, you're going to have a son, and people are going to rejoice, and he's going he's gonna to turn the people back to God. It's going to be awesome. And Zacharias said to the angel, how will I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until all these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. I, I like to think Gabriel yelled at him. If an angel ever comes and tells you something, just take his word for it. How do I know this is going to be true? Zacharias is doubting or looking for some sign or confirmation on what the angel's saying because his wife is barren, and not only has she been barren, she's old. So I think she's probably menopausal for all I know. How do I know this? Hey, hey, Zacharias, you're a Jew. Do you not remember Abraham and Sarah? Give me a break. And ain't you are in the temple. An angel has come to you in the temple and said, you're going to have a son, even though your wife is old, and you're going to sit there and doubt him. How dare you? This is Greta Thunberg. How dare you? This is like Greta Thunberg. It's Gabriel. I tell you what, Greta Thunberg's a terrible, insolent little child. But that's how Zacharias is asking, acting. But then Gabriel's like, how dare you? What? Where do you get? I do you know who I am? Do you know where I stand? Let me remind you where I stand. I stand in the presence of God. Do you stand in the presence of God? No, you don't. You're allowed in the temple once every seven years if you're lucky. I stand in the presence of God. Don't doubt me. So I just have to imagine Gabriel cut a promo on Zacharias here, and because Zacharias didn't believe him, or because he wanted some sign. Or some other kind of confirmation. Gabriel says, you're going to be silent. You're not going to be able to speak till it happens. Now, here's your sign. You can speak again when it happens. So, Gabriel, disgusted with Zacharias' attitude towards him, reminds him of who he is, where he comes from, what he does, and what he has come to do, which is to give Zacharias this good news. Zacharias should have been overjoyed at the good news but instead, he was dubious. He was doubtful. He was suspicious. And Gabriel did not take kindly to that. I'm down to one-eighth of a tank. I don't want to stop because I'm not sure my car will start again. All right, that's the Bible chapter review. Now let's move on to the inbox. And it's another question from Reed in California. By the way, thank you to those of you who wrote in over the break, including Reed, and including John from Slow Driving Florida. I've got some questions in the voicemail box. If you have a question about Christian theology or apologetics, you can write to SethDunn88 at gmail.com. SethDunn88 at gmail.com. And for you non-Southerners who, doesn't, who don't understand what write means... It's write. You can write. W-R-I-T-E. Write. But I say write. You can write to me at SethDunn88 at gmail.com and send me your question about Christian theology or apologetics. Keep it short. Tell me where you're from. Short enough for me to memorize. Or you can dial 470-315-0875. 470-315-0875 and leave me a message. And Google will translate, 75 for transcribe, I should say. 
Google will transcribe your message 75 with 75% accuracy and send it to my email inbox. Then I'll read it and listen to it and answer your question. I got two from Jeff from Slow Drive in Florida. Don't, by the way, don't call me before 8.30. I might be awake. I might not. But if you're one of these people who's up at 5 and you've got two hours of work and breakfast done before 7 o'clock, good for you. That ain't me. I'll be poking at databases tonight at midnight. And I ain't going to be up at 7.30. So that's just how I roll. All right. Good for you. For those of you who get up early, you're probably healthier and you probably manage your life better. But that is not me at this moment. All right, this question from the inbox. Reed in California. He's a like, hey, remember when you were talking the other day about John the Baptist being indwelt with the Holy Spirit from the womb? And you said, well, what does this tell the people who deny predestination and talk about free will all the time? Here, John the Baptist is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And what Reed's question is, are, he's basically saying this. Are you saying... That John the Baptist was saved because he was indwelt from the whole, by the, from uh, indwelt in the womb by the Holy Spirit for a purpose, and the parenthetical with that is just like all the other Old Testament saints. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes you hear it said that John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets, the last of the Old Testament prophets, because he's certainly a prophet. And he's a prophet like they would have had under the Old Covenant. This is before Pentecost. It's before the coming of Jesus. The Old Testament is finished. In fact, the, la the first thing since the end of the Old Testament that Israel heard from God was right here, that Zacharias heard from Gabriel, at least that we know of, uh, was right here. So sometimes we say that John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. That type of that type of person in that type of office. And we know the Holy Spirit, as Reed mentioned to me in his email, fell upon people before Jesus came and before Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended like tongues of fire onto the people and they could speak the languages. It's sort of when the, we understand Pentecost as the founding of the New Testament church, like the beginning of the church in the new covenant, a, a different era. Now, how did, what, well, but Seth, I thought you said the church is Israel and Israel's a church. It is. But that's just the understanding of Pentecost. By the way, that was that year's Pentecost. Pentecost is a festival that they always had. The Jews had lots of festivals like Passover, Pentecost, Sukkot. Um, but at that year's Pentecost, when the Jews were in town for Pentecost in, uh, in Jerusalem, Peter was preaching and then the, the tongues came and they received the Holy Spirit. And here's the idea. Is the apostles didn't have the Holy Spirit before. And we know that all Christians, upon their salvation, received the Holy Spirit. We're sealed for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. And not only are we sealed by the Holy Spirit, but we are given certain gifts by the Holy Spirit that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do or exercise, I should say, without the Holy Spirit. Tongues being the, the most obvious one from the day of Pentecost. Right? But there's others. And the gifts are for the benefit of the church. And what Reed mentions, he's like, well, hold on, what about Saul? Saul prophesied by the Holy Spirit, but he lost the Holy Spirit. And didn't David pray to God, don't take the Holy Spirit away from me? And even when people were building uh, the tabernacle, and make the artisans were making the artifacts for the tabernacle in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit allowed them to do that. But it's, the Holy Spirit could come and go in Old Testament times. Seth, are you teaching? Or were you saying that because John was indwelt by the Holy Spirit, he was therefore saved? I didn't say that. No. So if you pay careful attention to what I was saying, I even said, but wait a minute, Seth, does that mean they're saved? Are you saying he's saved because he's indwelt with the Holy Spirit? I'd put a little caveat on there. So my argument is not that John the Baptist was saved because he was indwelt with the Holy Spirit. My argument was that God is not this person that people imagine who is a quote-unquote gentleman 
who's up there respecting your free will. Because think of the people who reject predestination. So we've got our free will, and God's not going to circumvent our free will. And you got to choose to get saved, because God, God, God will just let you go to hell if that's what you want. Free will, free will, free will, because that's their argument. I'm not trying to make a straw man, but that whoever they are, that's what they say. And the reason I was bringing up John being indwelt with the Holy Spirit in the womb is because John did not ask for the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist. He didn't ask for it, did it? Did he? He was in the womb indwelled with the Holy Spirit. He was a little baby. He wasn't even born yet. He couldn't even cry because he wanted to breastfeed yet. He was in he was a fetus, a preborn baby. He was in the womb filled with the Holy Spirit. So what free will decision did he make to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit and carry out these acts that he carried out? God chose that for him. And you can say the same thing. Uh, was it Jeremiah? Behold, I know the plans I have for you. And was it, was, it, was it Isaiah or Jeremiah where God says, I know the plans I have for you. I've known since before you were born. Paraphrasing. I think it's Jeremiah. So when God calls somebody to do something, they're going to do it. If he's got it planned out for them. Jonah didn't want to do it. He ended up doing it anyway. It's not like God came to John when he was 12 years old and said, John, I got a really big job for you. You got to be the herald of Jesus. And you're a miracle baby. That's why he exists. Will you do this for me, John? He indwelled him from the womb with the Holy Spirit. It's like uh, Aria Atreides from Dune. Didn't have a choice for who she was going to be. For How about a sci-fi reference for you? You know what I did? over the break, I went and watched a movie in the theater. How about that? Took a vacation day on Monday and watched a movie in the theater. It was Dune 2. By the way, Arya Atreides is not in Dune 2, but she is in the book. They were not faithful to the book, but why, am I, why do I bring that uh, obscure literary character up is because in the little sci-fi world of Dune, she became conscious in the womb because of something that happened to her mother. I won't go down that rabbit trail. But it's not like she chose that. Just like John the Baptist didn't choose to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So the argument I was making it to the free will crowd, to the non-predestination crowd, was if God is indwelling someone with the Holy Spirit from the womb, whether or not it's salvific, he is obviously already make, making some decisions for that person and directing that person's life. But yes, we should be aware of this delineation between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. There were people in the Old Testament who the Holy Spirit would come upon them for them to do something, but then it, it could leave the He, He. Holy Spirit's not an it, it's a He. He, He, the Holy Spirit could then leave that person, and that person might be a reprobate. And I don't think John the Baptist was reprobate. And by the way, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. When we talk about regeneration, like, how are these Old Testament... This is just a... I'm not answering this question. This is just a question. This is a question of systematic theology. I'm not... I'm not answering it for the sake of this question. How are these people saved if they're not sealed by the Holy Spirit? Could they lose their salvation then? But we can't lose it now? So, I, let me just make this suggestion. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, I would argue that everyone who's ever been saved throughout history, whether looking forward to Christ like Abraham or looking back to Christ like we New Testament saints, were saved by God by, through faith, by grace through faith, in the same way, you've always been saved the same way, by grace through faith, Abraham believed and was credited to him as righteousness. 
even if they didn't receive some gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we, when we receive the Holy Spirit, that gives us a gifting to use in the church, in the New Testament church. Because listen, predestined is predestined. It doesn't just count for New Testament saints, it counts for Old Testament saints. Joseph is just as predestined as Paul for salvation. And yes, of course, they did stuff that we rank and file pew sitting Christians aren't going to do. But you know, even Jesus says, that Pete, you know, you're going to do th- talking to his disciples, you're going to do things greater than I am. All right? But let's not get too hung up. All right, let's try to understand things systematically. And no, Reed, I wasn't saying that. I'm sorry if I wasn't more clear about it. I thought I mentioned it. But I was just using a line of argumentation. And with that, I got a 16th of a tank left. I think I can make it back to Cartersville. Where am I going to eat? I can eat anywhere I want in Cartersville. It's got to be somewhere quick. I don't know yet. Let's go to free will of the gaps. Free will of the gaps, okay? What is a God of the gaps argument? All right, by the way, it's a bad one. It's how a lot of naturalists criticize uh, theists. I didn't say Christians, but theists for this. Like, there's something that we don't know what causes something. Well, the gods must be doing it. I, I don't have any way of explaining it. I don't have any scientific clue of what's causing it. I don't know. But people want an explanation, well, God or the gods did it. I don't understand thunder. Well, the gods are bowling in heaven. Yeah. You know, where did, how did the, how did the elephant get its snout? Where, you know, the gods wanted it to do it. You know, stuff like, where did this bear constellation come from? I mean, there's all kinds of God of the gaps myths out, out there where if, a society doesn't understand something. Well, God did it. And you're like, well, you know, we don't understand. We don't understand something, so we're just going to posit something. And by the way, it doesn't have to be God of the gaps. Luminetherous Aether, which I mention on the show all the time, is a good example of sort of science of the gaps. Like, oh, well, we don't know how the universe is, is, activate, is operating in this way. Like, how is light? Getting from places, lights a, you know, light is both a wave and a particle. But how is it? How is light traveling through space without some medium to get there? And oh, it's luminous for a We can't see it, but it's there. I think string theory, by the way, is the luminous aether of the 21st century. But that, there's science of the gaps too. But then there's there's God of the gaps. And we as Christians, especially Christian apologists, we don't want to do God of the gaps type stuff. And we understand that saying that God created the universe in the beginning, there were the heavens and the earth, God created the heavens and earth. That's not God of the gaps. Like we can't explain where it came from, so it must be God. Well, there wouldn't be anything if there wasn't God. That's not God of the gaps. That's just philosophy. That's just logic. But I have found that sometimes Christians will use a free will of the gaps explanation for things instead of a Bible explanation for things. Now, I am not rejecting any sort of free will theodicy. Oh, why? Or or what is, oh. Trans world depravity, for example. Trans world depravity. I'm not rejecting that. Any kind of free will theodicy. I'm not saying, well, there's no such thing as a free will theodicy. I am not talking about free will theodicies. If you don't know what that is, Google it. Come on, how long have you been listening to this show? A theodicy is a defense of God and some or a defense of the state of how God made things. Oh, well, there's sin in this world. There can't be a God if there's so much evil who's good. And then a theodicy is, well, you know, God gave people free will, entities free will. So sin exists because God gave people the free will to sin and that's why sin exists. And that's a theodicy like, yes, evil exists, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. It's because God gave us free will. So there's, that's a very cut and dry free will theodicy. You can Google the free will theodicy if you want to. But sometimes people will just see some problem in the world and say, well, you know, God gave free will. 
People give a free will theodicy about hell, which I think is terrible. Why, why does God let people go to hell? Well, you know, it's not God that's sending people to hell. Yes, the Bible literally says it is God who's sending the people to hell. Read Revelation. It's absolutely God who sends people to hell. And I don't, it doesn't seem like they want to go there. Uh, but people say, like, well, you know, to go to hell, you have to go right by the cross, right by the empty tomb. You know, you, want, you hate God and you want to go to hell, so that's, you know... No, I mean, yes, the people who go to hell do hate God, but so, don't come up with free will to explain something like that. Why does hell exist? Because God is holy, and a holy God cannot, this is ontologically, cannot, not that she doesn't want to, but cannot, ontologically speaking, he's omnipotent, but to be holy means you can't be around unholiness in paradise. That's an ontological statement. That's not a limitation on God cannot because he will not and he won't and he doesn't want to. Tolerate sin. Sin cannot go unpunished. Where do the unholy people go? They go to hell. Why? Because they not just being punished for their sins, but it's a separation from a holy God. Here's my gas light on. Why did I run out of gas? It was my free will not to stop for gas. So some people say like, oh yeah, God gave us free will and people, God just allows people to choose not to take his path. So there must be a hell for the people who choose. Listen, God's just not convincing the people. Is that what the Bible says? It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God predestines some to salvation and others he doesn't. But look at Romans vessels of honor and vessels meant for destruction. Will you look back to the maker and say, oh, why'd you make me this way? What right do you have? That's a little harder to stomach for the general population than free will. Oh, it's their choice. It's their choice. Well, it's their choice to be gay. It's their choice to have an abortion. It's their choice to do this bad thing. So it's their choice to go to hell. It seems to fit a little better. Like, what would you rather? What would you just rather not have any free will? You have a problem with hell. Would you, would you rather live in a world with hell or a world with no free will? And most people, I think, will say, I'd rather have a world with free will. I don't want to go to hell, but I'd rather have a world with free will. But I don't think that's really a biblical answer, because I don't find that theodicy in the Bible anywhere. It's just something somebody reasoned it to. So sometimes people will look at a certain situation as a, not evil in general. But why does this certain situation exist? Well, it's because God gave us free will. Where in the Bible do we even find the word free will? Or a Hebrew or Greek word translated into free will. You can find it in a free will offering. And a free will offering is an offering basically under the Old Testament sacrificial system that somebody gave to God but they weren't obligated to? Like, it's not like, oh, well, you know, I've had a son, so now I am obligated to sacrifice a spotless lamb to God in the place of my son. This is an obligation offering I have to make. Like, oh, it's Passover. We have to make an offering at Passover. Like, we have to do this. Oh, it's Yom Kippur. We have to give the scapegoat over. Like, we have to do this. Oh, I've sinned, and I've got to go make atone for my sin by making this specific offering as a specific response to some specific sin. A free will offering is just sort of this, cheer, you, you might call it the cheerful giving type offering. Oh, I want to make an offering to God. Good for you. It's a free will offering, like you weren't obligated to do it. And if you do like a Bible word search of the word free will, I mean, that's what you'll find. You're not going to find these free will theodicies. You're not even going to really find... A, a, a large concern of the biblical writers talking about free will. But for some reason, free will is kind of a go-to explanation, especially in Baptist circles. And what I want to say to you guys is let's not fall into that because it's easy to just kind of use this free will of the gaps, sort of an easy little escape clause. Oh, did you know this? Let's be people of the book let's find biblical answers and biblical explanations 
for why things are as they are. Now, no, don't anybody write in and say, Seth said we didn't have free will. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I, I'm going to pick where I eat at lunch right now. I'm picking. Find the biblical explanation. Do the sometimes hard or more difficult or less stomachable work of finding the answer for Scripture. I gave one example, the free will of the gaps to hell, but th there could be others out there. And let me encourage you to do this. There's going to be people in your church and in your Christian circle who are going to start explaining things to people by free will, even to you. And let me encourage you to go to them and say, like, show me in the Bible for that support of what you said. No, no, go, but you're wrong. But you know, go up and like, I don't agree with you on that. Can you show me on the Bible? Or even, I'm not sure I agree with what you said. Can you show me in Scripture about what you just said about free will? Because, you know, what? ultimately, like, it's a good argument if it's a scriptural argument. But there's going to be some people out there who'd be like, I'd rather God choose where I eat for lunch than to go to hell. So why can't God choose for, for me to go to heaven and be a Christian than to go to hell? Because that's a lot more important than where I'm going to lunch. Have you ever thought about that? Like, your decision for Christ, or your decision contrarily to reject Christ, is the most important eternal decision you'll ever make. More important than your spouse, choosing your spouse, or choosing to divorce your spouse and marry another one. More important than, than any choice you'll ever make for your kids or any choice that you make that will have an impact on your kids because guess what parents your choices have impacts on your kids whether you like it or not and by the way you choosing Christ is going to have a better impact on your kids by the way Christ chooses you um, but please don't uh, don't pick apart my language but to reject the general call how about that y'all invent some we're inventing terms I'll use some invented Calvinist terms the uh, general call and the effectual call, which aren't in the Bible by word. But hey, word concept fall fallacy. Just because the, word, the words aren't in there doesn't mean the concept isn't. Okay? The concept is there. To reject the general call is the most damning decision you'll ever make. That is a, that's going to set you to hell for eternity in your sin. And I just have trouble believing that there's anybody out there who would value his or her free will. And I know people are idolaters of self, so maybe I shouldn't have such trouble imagining. But I can tell you this. I'd rather never get to pick where I eat lunch ever again and have that preordained by God. To, and even eat at bad places, like the, the salad-only restaurant or Indian restaurants that don't have meat. I mean, or, ugh, ugh than for God to choose to send me to hell forever. I would rather eat... I would rather God preordain me to eat gas station taquitos, which are going to have a QT. That's not what I'm going to eat for lunch. Than to preordain me to go to hell. Okay? I am very thankful that God left that most important choice up to Himself. Thanks for listening to the Christian Commute. Lord willing, I'll be back with you again Thursday. As always, God bless. And as always, remember Christianity is not about getting saved. It's about being saved.